and welcome to uh, the last panel of what has been a wonderful conference, Voices from the Archive, 1763. Um, I'd like to reiterate thank yous, well, to all of you for being here, um, and especially to Margot and to Ted and to the amazing staff of the John Carter Brown Library for making all of this possible and really having such a delightful weekend. Before opening the floor to the presentations of my esteemed colleagues, um, I just wanted to say a little bit about what inspired this particular roundtable or panel. I was fortunate enough to have been a JCB tw uh, fellow twice, in 2003 and again in 2010. And it was great because when I was here in 2003, it was at the very beginning of my project. When I was here in 2010, it was when I was working on revisions for my manuscript. Um, and I had a chance to find out everything that I had missed the first time around. Um, and while I was hunting through the catalog on my second sojourn, I discovered a publication from the JCB, uh, quite timely given the lunchtime talk that we heard, entitled The French and Indian War, an Album. A slim, elegant, illustrated booklet that showcased material from the library as part of an exhibit on that topic that took place that year. So this is 1960. It was my reintroduction to the resources available at the library for the Seven Years' War. And the pamphlet also made me think. It was titled as an album of the French and Indian War. In considering that I proposed my research topic on the Seven Years' War, it reminded me how far historians have worked on the subject and how much they have added in the intervening 40 years. The album's material, all of which I made sure to look at that fall, depicted um, or were depicted from an Anglo-American and British perspective. But in their breadth, these materials showcased the diversity of the John Carter Brown Library's collection and its truly Atlantic scope. Maps, prints, published accounts came from Iberian, Luso Atlantic, French, and British Atlantic perspectives, and they really helped to bring that album to life. And just as an example of this, one of the featured items in the album, and I assume in the exhibit in 1960, was a, um, a pamphlet talking about the Battle of Fort William Henry, made famous by James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans. So the pamphlet that is in the album is a Portuguese pamphlet published in Lisbon in 1757. Um, I have no Portuguese, but it's the uh, relation of the battle of, I'm going to turn it over to my pitch editor, Katia. Sao Jorge. Sao Jorge. <laughs> um, which is amazing because the British name for the fort was William Henry, and Portugal was nominally supporting Britain in this, meaning that this Portuguese pamphlet had relied on French pamphlets, La Relation de la Bataille de Saint Georges, which was the French name for the fort. And so even if the album itself was not talking about the Atlantic and global dimensions, its materials were. That volume became this roundtable's starting point to consider the wonderful trove of materials at the library from the era of the Seven Years' War. Besides the timeliness of the 1763 anniversary, the John Carter Brown has a wonderful contribution to offer to scholarship on the Seven Years' War through its collection. It can help us find voices in the archives, stories that fellows past and present bring to life. For a library so well known for its print collection, today's panelists hope to showcase something a little different as well, manuscripts. I should point out as a side note that there is also a piece of material culture held by the John Carter Brown, similar to the C quadrant that Susan Danforth brought up. There's actually a powder horn from the Seven Years' War in the library's collection, which I had um, the delight of seeing and unfortunately did not take a photograph of. It is a lovely piece, though. So today's roundtable hopes to invite conversation on two fronts. First are the new directions that historians working on the Seven Years' War or on the mid-18th century have begun to forge since that 1960 publication. And I'm going to pose a question that I hope my panelists will take up at some point, which is where do you see the historiography of the Seven Years' War moving from this point forward? And second, through the contribution of our final panelist, we will be looking at the public service rendered by archives, such as the John Carter Brown Library, in moments of national attention and commemorations of the past. Next year, we'll be concluding a series, a long series, of celebrations of the 250th anniversary of the Seven Years' War. Um, and before I turn this over to Charlie Foy, our first panelist, I just wanted to make a statement, since we actually have a nice sort of uh, comparative Atlantic perspective here. I work on the French Atlantic. <laughs> 
And what I realized that the manuscripts of the John Carter Brown that I've used have enabled me to see are the ways in which, in terms of French historiographic tradition, how the field has expanded. Um, for one thing, we have French historians from France now really pursuing a French Atlantic experience, including the Seven Years' War. Cécile Vidal was a fellow here last year, um, and that's really been a great contribution that the John Carter Brown, through its inclusion of historians and researchers from around the world, has contributed to. Um, second, people are thinking past the dates of the war, past 1754 as the war's beginning in North America, past 1760, the conquest of Canada, or 1763, the Treaty of Paris, and really paying attention to what happens in the aftermath of this cataclysmic event. And the last is that I've noticed in looking at Fellow's proposals of the last few years, especially on the French side, that people have started to do research in theaters of the war that haven't been traditionally included, particularly in Louisiana and in the Illinois country. Um, at least two fellows in the last year, Alexandre Dubé and Robert Engelbert, have been pursuing this as well. So really kind of moving the boundaries, not just in terms of time, but space as well. So one of the resources that I have had the great fortune of working on, um, and there are actually two resources, one that I found in 2003, one that I was looking at in 2010. The one in 2010 was the Henry Fletcher manuscript, which you will also be hearing more about from Elena Schneider, um, the Seven Years War Journal of the Proceedings of the 35th Regiment of Foot, an extraordinary document of a man who managed to be present at almost every interesting location in the American theater of the war. Fletcher moved from the siege of Fort William Henry, which I just mentioned, to the siege of Louis Bourg in 1758, to the Battle of the Plains of Abraham in 1759. And you have to wonder if Fletcher ever encountered another famous Atlantic traveler who was going to have been talked about by our unfortunate panelist who couldn't make it, um, Vincent Caretta, Olauda Equiano, who was also there. Um, from Canada, Fletcher moved to Martinique, to Port Royal, to the siege of Havana, and then to Pensacola. That he survived is pretty miraculous, right? All of these different places. That the diary's shape, demonstrating that it was designed to fit into a saddlebag, not only survived, but survived with its beautiful watercolors intact, is just as marvelous. And it really helps to give a sense of an individual's journey through different theaters of the war. I was fortunate enough to look at this beautiful object in Susan Danforth's office where it had been moved for conservation when I was here in 2010. And thanks to the commitment of the JCB in making its resources available, the Fletcher manuscript is now actually accessible through archives.org in its full text. It is a really beautiful piece, although I'm grateful that I, I got to experience its materiality in the moment. Fletcher's manuscript was something that I was able to bring into dialogue with a manuscript I had looked at in 2003, the journal of <coughs> Anne Hippolyte Maurès, Comte de Malartique, who fought on the other side of the war. He was a French officer who came over to America in 1755. Unlike Fletcher's manuscript, the codex held by the JCB from Malartique is, is not the original, it's a copy. And it really invites reflection on something that was talked about yesterday, which are the ways in which manuscripts really circulate in, in different ways than text, printed text, right? That somebody took the time to copy out this diary. All the more precious because for the French Atlantic tradition, there is only one published account of the French experience of the war in North America that is contemporary to the period, and that is Pierre Pouchot's Histoire de la Guerre, which the JCB also has a copy of, right? So the Maurès manuscript was something that was circulating hand to hand to hand and ended up fortuitously in the John Carter Brown. And really thinking about the ways in which a French individual experienced the war alongside the way that a British individual experienced the war and the people that they described within. One of the most amazing things about the Fletcher manuscript were these tiny footnotes that he added after the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, describing the irascible and volatile nature of General James Murray, who apparently exploded quite a bit in the battle. And what made this such a wonderful voice from the archive for me is that I ended up going to the Clements Library after this and discovered James Murray's correspondence with General Gage. Murray had a love of the exclamation mark that I have never seen before in 18th century letters. Every letter to Gage begins, dear sir, with an exclamation mark, and ends, I am truly yours, sir. 
And it really made me understand, having read the Fletcher manuscript, this was the man's personality on paper, that the explosion I had read about at the JCB was a real tribute to the personality of this individual. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Charlie Foy, our first panelist. Charlie Foy is Assistant Professor of History at Eastern Illinois University. He is the author of numerous um, journal articles that have appeared in the International Maritime History Journal, um, in the Princeton Companion to Atlantic History, in Slavery and Abolition, and the Journal for Maritime Research, among some. He is currently at work on a book manuscript entitled Liberty's Labyrinth, Freedom in the 18th Century Black Atlantic. Charlie Foy. Thanks, Christian. Um, and thanks, I want to start off by thanking Ted and the staff, particularly Kim, as we'll, I'll go through the, um, my, my, my short um, observations. Kim plays an important role in uh, my work on here. 1763, um, what was the meaning, what was the importance of this year, um, particularly for black mariners, enslaved individuals in Rhode Island? And I want to focus on Rhode Island. Um, maybe a way of thinking about it is thinking in, in contrast to other groups of people. So for a British colonial official in 1763, the Treaty of Paris raises issues in terms of what to do with the new empire. Um, Cuba out, Canada in, these new North American residents are sort of uh, restless. Um, what to do for North American British residents is the whole issue about the Grenville reform <laughs> and then the, the, the events leading up to the burning of gas being which we're all going to celebrate tonight. Um, for enslaved blacks here in Rhode Island, the question was quite different. Um, and the way I characterize it is celebration of concern, um, and I'll get back to which one of those two it is, but it's quite different than it is for white settlers and white residents of British North America. So what I want to do today in my brief uh, comments is just to use two sets of manuscript documents here to sort of illustrate um, the impact on the end of the war on blacks in Rhode Island in particular. Um, in doing so, um, the documents are the Brown family papers and the labor books of the Arnold, paper, of the Arnold family, particularly Welcome Arnold. Um, the Welcome Arnold uh, labor of books, um, hold on. Um, this is it, have actually never been utilized before. Um, they're moth eaten um, and they are quite unique um, in my experience having traveled the Atlantic world looking for black mariners, they actually have an incredibly detailed rendition of black life um, from enslavement during the American Revolution through freedom into the 1780s and 1790s. And so in some respects, the, the Arnold papers are unique in that they really give an overview of this transitional moment that's fairly important. Um, I'm sure you're all thinking, wait a minute, he's talking about 1763. Why are we jumping forward? It'll be obvious in a few moments. I want to do a comparison. Um, so let's go back to 1763 and what is, in fact, the state of black life in Rhode Island. Um, like through most of the 18th century, although there is a change over time in which, as you go decade to decade through the 18th century, the Atlantic world becomes blacker in that there are, far, me, there are far greater numbers of mariners of both enslaved and free uh, black men who go to sea as we go through this, the, um, the century. But in 1763, we're in a moment in time in which there are substantial numbers of blacks in the Atlantic world. Um, they are not only working on the docks of Newport and Providence, loading and repairing ships in quite large numbers, but they are working on fishing vessels. They are working on coasters. They are working on slave ships. They are working on naval vessels for both all sides of the conflict, and they are working on slave ships. So in terms of thinking about the maritime world, thinking about the Atlantic world, these men from Rhode Island can be found in all the segments of the world, of this, this community, both in terms of building the ships, repairing the ships, and working on all types of ships. Um, they include people like Negro Boy, um, Edward Abbey, um, who served, excuse me, who served on the, the Brown family slave ship, the Sally in 1764, um, and Richard, who, excuse me, guys, this one, Richard, who was from the Arnold family, who served um, for 
some period of time, but he said had followed the sea for a number of years, indicative of the fact, in fact, if he wasn't an able-bodied seaman, he clearly had actually been at sea for an extended period of time. Whether he was there for three years, being able-bodied seaman or not, we don't know. This kind of advertisement is not unusual in the mid-18th century. Um, I have a database of approximately 22,000 plus black mariners, and this kind of ad, this kind of reference to a black um, in Rhode Island is pretty um, commonplace, quite frankly. Um, and this kind of a situation of, let's go back for a moment, um, an ad like this where it's referencing in 1763 wanting five Negro men, three of them sailors, two of them masters of the Cooper's trade, is also complex. Um, this idea that blacks are critical to the actual maritime economy of Rhode Island, which is central to both Newport and Providence's ability to function, both in the war but also in the larger economy, is critical. Um, so having said that, we get to 1763, um, and we also have this treaty, and then the issue becomes to black and black mariners, how does it impact their lives? Um, before I want to answer the question, I just also want to indicate one very simple thing. These men worked for large numbers of merchants here in Rhode Island, not just the Brown family, not just the Arnold family, who are there's very detailed records for. But for example, Aaron Lopez, who many people have done a fair amount of research on in terms of Lopez as a slave trader. In fact, if one looks at the Aaron Lopez papers, and believe me, it's a horrible exercise, the all the microfilm was very blurry, and it's not fun to do. But if you go through it and you literally follow Lopez's economic endeavors over decades, he is employing blacks at sea, insisting him in enslaving other blacks over the decades. So by the time we get to 1763, and we get this moment when the Treaty of Paris comes into play, blacks are integrated, they're well established, and they're integral to the operation of this maritime economy. So, um, just to maybe answer a question you might be thinking about, the first question might be, well, why? Um, Jeff Bolsch has a great expression that ship captains employed men with, quote, more an eye to muscle than complexion. And I think that's the way to think about maritime life here in the 18th century is that for all sorts of reasons, including the lack of um, uh, sufficient maritime uh, manning, um, maritime fugitives, i.e. slaves who sought to escape by the sea, were employed because they were usable and they were valuable for that skill. So we get to 1763, this critical moment Celebration, concern, change of employment or not? Well, it's a horrible moment. This is a moment in which, in fact, the, the world changes for black mariners. Um, and in saying that, I'm about to illustrate this very simply. This time period, this moment in 1763, is not a singular moment. Um, one of the central themes of my scholarship is that war is a central and important um, component in shaping lives of black mariners in North America and also in the Caribbean. That the opening and the, the war itself opens all kinds of opportunities for black men at sea. And when peace comes, things change. So um, here's a, a graph that shows you the number of maritime futures, those men who attempt to flee by sea out of these three North American port cities, Pennsylvania, New York, and Rhode Island. And as you can see, from the time period of peace prior to the Seven Years' War, well, only a few maritime futures, to during the war, it jumps up tremendously. After the war, it increases slightly, but largely because, quite frankly, uh, the Royal Navy still has a fairly substantial presence here. But then again, at 1775, it jumps up substantially. Um, and then the question would come, well, why? Well, here's the simple answer. Because many needs are following the same pattern of up and down, up and down. Um, literally in peacetime, um, the Royal Navy's manning tracks significantly, and in the wartime, it expands. Um, I will want to say one parenthetical, because this is a methodological question. I'm using the Royal Navy musters because, quite frankly, unlike merchant ships, we have very complete records for them, and you can literally track and be able to indicate manning levels on that basis, whereas with merchant ships, it's more difficult, it's more speculative. 
But based on my experience of looking at many muscle rolls from merchant, uh, mer uh, merchant marines, it's a similar up, down, up, down. So, is 1763 for black mariners a similar situation or is it a one-off? Is this a circumstance where somehow it's different or not? In fact, it's pretty, it's pretty standard in terms of end of Queen Anne's War, end of uh, War Jenkins Ear, end of the American Revolution, the same thing happens. So 1763 very simply is a moment when the maritime industry here in Rhode Island constricts tremendously. The Royal Navy le launched lead for the waters. There's an economic recession here in terms of the merchants are not recovering after the war. Uh, a lot of people engaged in trading that and made money during the war are quite frankly scrambling for new economic opportunities and blacks find little opportunity at sea. So between 1763 and 1775 is a fallow period in terms of opportunities for freedom for black mariners here in New York. <laughs> so I want to end this very brief observation by giving you the example in 1775 of how things change. In 1775, the HMS Rose shows up on the waters outside of Newport. Um, if you read newspaper accounts in the Newport Mercury, there's a fair amount of hysteria about James Rose, the captain of the, of the excuse me, uh, James Wallace, the captain of the Rose. He's depicted by American newspapers as a dastardly man, someone who can't be trusted. And why can't Wallace be trusted? Is he someone who's illegal in his business dealings? Somebody who's torturing you know, the, 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 the citizens of Rhode Island? No, he can't be trusted because blacks are fleeing to his boat in large numbers. The HMS Rose's muster roll is replete with blacks fleeing to his boat. And so when the residents of Newport talk about Wallace, there's anger, there's hatred about this man because he is literally taking money out of their pocket. And it's not small numbers. Literally in the time period between 1775 when Rose first shows up, in the middle of 1776, four score slaves run to his boat. 25 of these men who flee to his boat ultimately have what I would call long-term careers in the Royal Navy, meaning they served more than a year. And many of them went from the rows to other boats. And there's one man in particular who landed going on nine different ships across the Atlantic and serving in the English Channel right through the end of the American Revolution and ultimately declared himself to be a British citizen um, in his own words. So the Royal Navy and Wallace as an individual, from the views of men like Welton Arnold or Aaron Lopez or the Browns, was not merely just an enemy who was basically enslaving them, but he, he was someone, the Navy was, the British Navy was a, a force in which actually was taking away their money. But for blacks, who saw the Royal Navy show up or it's outside of Newport in 1775, it was a beacon of freedom. And Simon Chong, who's a little bit overstated in this case, actually gets it right. When blacks in North America see the Royal Navy during the American Revolution, they see opportunity, they see doors open. So to recapitulate, 1763 is a door shut, shut very hard, very firmly, and very few blacks leave Newport at that time period. So from the view of the black population of Newport, Providence, and the rest of the colony, the Treaty of Paris is not a good thing. Simply stated, it's the end of a time period in which they found freedom. Thank you. Next, we have a presentation by Elena Schneider. Elena Schneider is the Omohundro Institute for Early American History's NEH postdoctoral fellow, and also a visiting assistant professor in the Department of History at the College of William and Mary. Um, she is the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships from, obviously, the John Carter Brown Library, um, also from the McNeil Center in Early American Studies, um, and from the Library Company of Philadelphia. She is currently at work on a manuscript based on her dissertation, The Occupation of Havana, War, Trade, and Slavery in 18th Century Cuba. <laughs> 
the JCB staff and to Ted Wimmer for organizing this conference and for making my time as a fellow. I was here two months in the fall of 2010, both a very stimulating but also very fun experience. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the British invasion and occupation of Havana at the end of the Seven Years' War. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what some of the manuscript sources at the JCB have been able to do to shed some new light um, on it. Um, I, I also use this Henry Fletcher manuscript that Christiane mentioned. And actually, I should say, because Christiane and I were here at the same time, when she vacated that chair in Susan Danforth's office, I occupied it in case of the start, um, reading um, for my own interest, uh, the manuscript. Um, but um, I, I wanted to talk about what it does to connect the North American and Caribbean theaters of the war, um, and what it can tell us that's new, in particular, about the role of Native Americans and people of African descent uh, in the Seven Years' War. I just have a couple of slides, because there are really wonderful visuals that have to do with the British occupation of Havana, and I just sort of threw a couple up here, and I'm not going to complicate them in the way I would like to, but I just thought I would do that. Um, so um, this year, uh, 2012, is the 250th anniversary of the British invasion and occupation of Havana. And actually, June 6th, this Wednesday, was the 250th anniversary of the arrival of the massive British fleet on the coast of Havana. Um, uh, if you listened very, very carefully on Wednesday night, you might have heard some commemorative cannon fire being exploded in Havana. Um, or maybe that was last night. Um, uh, there's a conference in Havana, actually, um, the first week in July to commemorate the event. Um, it's co-sponsored by the Cuban government and by the British and Spanish embassies um, in Cuba. Um, I'm going to attend it. And unfortunately, um, even though there were 4,000 troops from British North America who were um, involved in the siege, the US government has nothing to do with this um, commemoration. Um, it's, a, it's yet another important element of our Cold War strategy um, with regard to Cuba. But, um, this slide here is a British depiction of the view of the coast off Havana on June 6, 1762. Uh, on that day, there were in total 230 British ships arriving. Um, they carried 10,000 sailors, 12,000 soldiers, 2,000 enslaved Africans, um, and 600 free black militiamen. Those 4,000 soldiers from uh, British North America arrived a bit later, um, but altogether, the expedition brought over 28,000 people, gathered collectively from Britain, from continental Europe, from British North America, and from the West Indies. And that's not just from the British West Indies, that's from Martinique and Guadeloupe. There are even individuals I find in deserters lists from Curaçao. Um, to give some kind of, if you put all these people together, you're, you're, this large expedition is converging on a city of 50,000 people at this point in time. So to give you some kind of point of reference, um, to think about this massive agglomeration of bodies in Havana on June 6th of 1762. Um, the most populous city in British North America at the time is New York, and it's only 28,000 people um, at the time. You know, I can't help but think that the globe sort of tilted on its axis that day with the number of people <laughs> moving into Havana. Um, the siege lasted six weeks and the occupation 11 months until Cuba was returned in exchange for Florida at the um, um, Treaty of Paris. But to this day, it is the most dramatic event in the history of Havana. Um, uh, Fidel marching in in January of 1959 was also important, but this is definitely the most dramatic event. Um, in my approach to the siege, what I, what I try to do is take a, a long and broad historical view of the event and place it within a wider context, both of Cuba's tr uh, transformations across the 18th century and also Cuba's relations with other American colonies, particularly British ones, in times of war and peace. So I'm really looking at the way circuits of war making and of contraband trade and of slave trading moved in and out of Cuba during times of war and peace. And not to think of the British invasion and occupation as this dramatic rupture that sort of occurred out of place in time uh, in Cuba. Um, and then, the broader aim is to do it is to try and do an, an interconnected history between British and Spanish empires. Um, so, an important task in telling this history, of course, is trying to answer the critical question of who exactly were all these <coughs> soldiers, sailors, and officers on this expedition? Um, where were they coming to Havana from? What were their experiences there? And where did they go afterwards? Or where did they not go afterwards, considering how many died of yellow fever? 
um, as many as 6,000 died in Elfie were compared to um, nearly, not even 600 that died from the fight among the British soldiers. Um, the repercussions of what happened in Havana would reach far beyond the city, um, back to the home place, places and further destinations of all those people that converged there at that time. Um, for example, uh, the troops from British North America, they arrived very late, just a couple days before the uh, surrender of the city. Um, but because of the timing of the rains and of the mosquito hatches, they were hit particularly hard by yellow fever. So there was, there's one Connecticut regiment that lost 76 people who died. Only They only had 20 survivors and 11 deserters. Um, so we have to think about those, Havana, those uh, Havana widows in Connecticut as being part of this story. Um, <coughs> So to make an argument like this and to try and draw these histories together, I obviously need sources for many different national and imperial archives. Um, this is why the JCB was surprisingly, and, and, and it was, I expected it to be very helpful in this regard, but also I found that I was surprised by some of the things that I found here. Um, it, of course, the holdings, of course, include prints and books having to do with the British siege, but also letters, for example, that document uh, a trade between Cuba and Newport from the 1740s. And our tra traditional understanding of the beginning of trade between Cuba and British North America is that it starts with the American Revolution. Um, but that's certainly not the case as we begin piecing together and looking for it, bringing these um, sources together. Um, the Henry Fletcher manuscript that Christiane was talking about has been critical for a number of reasons. Actually, Christiane, when you were mentioning, you were wondering if he, um, Henry Fletcher ran into that famous traveler of the Seven Years' War as well, uh, Aguiano. I thought you also might wonder if he had run into um, Forrest Gump, because his story is <laughs> similar in that way. Um, but what's really helpful to me, and what was new for me, and maybe it wouldn't seem so new to those of you who, who think about the Seven Years war, Year War more in the North American context, but for me it was a really important reminder that experiences of these troops in Cuba were deeply connected, affected by their prior years of service in the North American theater of the war. Um, of those troops that amassed, those British troops that amassed in Havana, 4,000 came directly from Britain, um, and 8,000 uh, were redirected from Admiral um, Rodney's campaign uh, in Martinique, in Guadeloupe. But of those men, they had been redirected from North America, and many of them came directly from the siege of Quebec. Um, so for Fletcher, as with the majority of the soldiers on the Havana campaign, the Caribbean campaigns were shorter and relatively easier battles at the end of several long, grueling, snowy, and icy winters in Canada, um, fighting against the French and both with and against Native Americans. In fact, when you read the journal and that of other men on the expedition, you can see that prior experiences with Native Americans seemed to haunt soldiers on the Havana expedition, and they inform the way the they view the people they encounter there. Indians sometimes serve as a mental point of reference for understanding people of African descent in Cuba in these journals and accounts. Um, for example, during the occupation of Havana, one of the soldiers who joined the campaign from the North American theater of the war, uh, but who was Scottish, wrote that black women in Havana dress, quote, in the squaw fashion, end quote. Um, in another journal while, uh, that I read while I was here at the JCB, uh, it's the journal Roswell Park, who's a volunteer from Connecticut. He describes, he arrives very late as the North American troops did. He's very excited to finally make it there. He uh, describes walking to a hilltop and peering over at Havana. Um, uh, and then he describes being shot at, at what he describes as Spanish Indians. Um, and, then, and then he writes, but we could not find them, uh, so we returned. Um, I think it's unlikely that it was shot at by Spanish Indians. Um, I think it's unlikely that there were actual Indians shooting on Roswell Park, given where he was in Cuba, uh, next to Havana, and the timing of his arrival. Um, it's important, obviously, to understand his impressions of what he's doing in Cuba and how he reads his experience there, as informed by what he has heard about and seen in North America and uh, that theater of the war. Um, but also, it's funny that he actually could have been right, and this connects to what Julie Kim was saying yesterday. Despite this trope of indigenous extinction in the Caribbean, in the 18th century, there is an indigenous presence in Cuba at this time. And historians of the Siege of Havana and historians of 18th century Cuba in general do not write about this. Um, and if you take Roswell Park's potentially fantastical notion of 
who he thinks who was shooting on him at that particular moment. But if you think about it, and if you take it seriously, there is a possibility, actually. Because we know that um, during the British invasion and occupation of Guantanamo in 1741, um, particularly in eastern Cuba, there are actually two companies of Indian militias that fight the British off during their uh, attempt to move on Santiago de Cuba. Um, if you look for it, you'll find it. Also, at this time in 1762, near Havana, Guanabacoa, which is a village next to Havana at this time, it's known as an Indian town. And that's where the first wave of uh, the British attack comes. Uh, that's not where Roswell Park is. But, um, and then in addition to that, another category of indigenous peoples that are in uh, Havana at this time are a group called Huachinangos. And they're fascinating, but it's, this is a connection between New Spain and Cuba. Actually, Guachinangos are, it's an ethnic and juridical label that's used in Cuba at the time, but it applies to indigenous people sent from Veracruz, often as convicts, to do forced labor on the fortifications projects. But if you look for them, they're involved in fighting against the British in 1762. Um, and they're, uh, they're often coupled together with the uh, royal slaves that are working on the fortifications projects. Um, I guess um, you know, this, this main reminder, I think, of, of, for me of the Fletcher Manuscript is really the importance of, of connecting the North American and the Caribbean theater, and then also of understanding a certain escalation of violence on the North American um, frontier of the war and how that might have affected what happened in the Caribbean. Um, for instance, Henry Fletcher, um, well, let me say that the experience fighting with and against Indians would have informed modes of warfare by the time these particular troops arrive in the Caribbean, and also attitudes towards non-European combatants um, during the sieges of both Martinique and Havana. Henry Fletcher, in his journal, um, claims that uh, two quote-unquote real Indians had come along with them from the siege of Quebec to Martinique. I don't know if they make it all the way to um, Havana, and I wouldn't want to speculate about who these individuals were. But he mentions them as part of a company that include rangers dressed as Indians. They dress and paint themselves as Indians um, while they're in Martinique. They don't get mentioned again for Havana, but it's possible this is still happening. In the Martinique campaign, Henry Fletcher writes that on the 9th of January, 1762, quote, the rangers, in scouring the country, took an officer of militia prisoner, uh, this man is French, who was excessively frightened, supposing the rangers to be Indians being dressed and painted as such, end quote. This piece of evidence suggests two things. One is that rumors about the North American theater of the war circulating in the Caribbean at the time that would help to explain the, the French militia man's fear. Um, it also corroborates the sense that certain modes of warfare developed on the, on the North American front are um, transported in a, to the Caribbean and affect the worst conduct there. So just to give a little final episode, um, I'd like to just um, invite you into uh, a little bit of my process of trying to piece together the battle and some of the confusion that's um, uh, built into it. I just want to ex describe to you one particular incident uh, in the final days of the siege. Um, this is William Keppel, and that's the, it's a painting from the National Maritime Museum, and that's the Moro Fortress at the entrance to Havana Bay, and it's been blown up by British mine here. So on the 30th of July, 1762, British forces under the command of William Keppel exploded a mine under the Moro Fortress, guarding the entrance to the Bay of Havana. Immediately thereafter, Keppel's troops stormed the fort. After 44 days of siege, the Spanish captain in the Moro, Don Luis de Velasco, was killed, leaving the 800 soldiers under his command on their own inside the Moro. In the face of the British onslaught, many of these men sought to flee, crowding into boats or jumping into the water to swim back across the bay to the protection of Havana's city walls. There are competing accounts of what happened next. Um, I probably have 10 to 15 different sources, some of them um, from the British side, some from the Spanish side. Um, uh, and they, they range from the official return from William Keppel to letters written by residents of Havana back to Spain in the days after the Spanish surrender. Many of these sources claim that rather than take prisoners, as they did with many white soldiers they encountered, the British forces reportedly killed many of the armed blacks and mulattoes they found among the Spanish troops. 
A Havana resident writing to a correspondent in Madrid shortly after the siege described how, quote, Velasco died with his sword in his hand and by his side honorable officials of the regiments of Spain, Aragon, and the Plaza. The blacks and mulattoes that didn't manage to escape were put to the knife, and the portion of the troops that could do nothing but surrender were taken prisoner, end quote. There's other correspondence between the Havana City Council and the Council of the Indies that mentions that after the capitulation, a rumor spread among free and enslaved blacks and guachinangos that the British would kill them for having taken part in the defense of the plaza. A British soldier wrote in his journal that 400 men, quote, were slaughtered on the spot during the storming of the Moro, um, though he makes no mention of any racial animus to the killing. Um, Keppel's official return, which is what virtually every history of the siege uh, uses, um, does not acknowledge this. He claims only 130 Spaniards were killed, and 213, he writes, drowned while trying to escape or were shot at and killed in boats. I don't know how he can be so exact, given that these people died on the water. Um, but I mentioned this, I mentioned this um, episode, and I'll, I'll wrap it up right now, for, because I think it just makes three important points. One is of the central, the central role of people of African descent in the defense of Havana. Um, and this is both militia members and slaves who volunteer to fight in return for their freedom. Um, and in order to make sense of that, we need, I need to, we need to connect this episode backwards and forwards in time in Cuban history, back to a long history of black militias and the roles that they've played in Cuba um, since 1600. We need to connect it forward to the uh, expanded militarization and, uh, of both black, uh, populations of African and European descent across Spanish America writ large during the Bourbon reforms era and after 1763. We also need to connect it to 1812, to the Aponte Rebellion in Cuba, which was allegedly led by a free black militiaman who, um, in his defense, in his um, trial, um, much was made of the fact that he had a, um, a picture of a black soldier in Cuba defeating a white British, um, white British soldiers, and that he supposedly used this picture to help rally support uh, for his rebellion. Um, we also, I also mention it, the other sort of important point to me about this incident is that the importance in our own accounts of the Seven Years' War, or war generally, not to be in such a rush to iron out the uncertainty around these um, episodes and the competing points of view, and that in our, in our rush to iron out those various versions and to assume a sort of authoritative historian's voice, uh, we privilege what we think happened over what people then may have thought may have happened, which is more important, uh, to my mind, to explaining events. Um, to do, military historians don't like to acknowledge that kind of uncertainty, so I think it's you know, a helpful reminder. Um, and also, it's a reminder of how important it is to use many sources from many sides and in many languages um, uh, to try and capture this event that where people journey to it from so many different directions. Um, I guess the, my final point would be that the Fletcher manuscript specifically, and then this connective, um, this way of thinking connectively about the North American and the Caribbean theaters of the war, um, make another very strong argument for a need for a connected and integrated approach um, to the Seven Years' War, to the various theaters of it, and then to generally the way that we do uh, the history of the Americas at this moment. Um, the strongest argument for connected and an integrated approach is that people moved between these places that we like to study separately. Um, so I'll stop now. I'm sure I've gone over time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, our final speaker um, who will bring in, or I guess bring us up to the present commemoration is Donald C. Carlton Jr. He uh, is a Brown alum. He worked with Tim Harris and Gordon Wood in getting his MA in history from Brown. And he's been working in the museum and nonprofit world for over 15 years. He was at the Rhode Island Historical Society for six years on both the curatorial side and also in development and strategic planning. And now he is the project director for the 1763 commemoration at the Old State House in Boston, which will be taking place next year. First of all, I'd like to uh, follow up my uh, predecessors here on this panel and just saying, uh, really uh, thanking the um, uh, JCB for uh, the opportunity to speak today. And I'd like to especially thank um, uh, 
both uh, Ted Widmer and uh, Margaret Nishimura because um, the JCB has, has allowed itself to be sort of drawn into this uh, uh, wild and crazy project that I put together to try to uh, commemorate the end of the war. Um, and I'm very grateful for their involvement in that and also for the opportunity to speak today. And I'd also like, of course, to thank uh, Christiana and Crouch for uh, chairing this panel and um, allowing me to pinch hit since uh, Vince Corita couldn't uh, attend, and to both uh, Elena Schneider and Charles Foy for suffering the presence of a, a scholar Marquet uh, in their presence. And I very much enjoyed both of those uh, presentations and hope that I don't embarrass myself over much. Um, but as you know, and actually, can everyone hear me if I walk away from this? I tend to like to. Can you what? Oh, okay. Well, this is, sort of, okay. Well, um, as you all know by this point, uh, next year will be the 250th anniversary of the uh, 1763 uh, Peace of Paris, as well as the Royal Proclamation of that year, which implemented uh, key North American um, provisions of the treaty. And um, is this the? Uh, Sorry, which way do I go? I'm sorry. I guess you just got to run this off. Well, there's a lot of fumbling around in them on TV, too. Jeez. Well, anyway. Um, uh, this, pro the, this project had its um, genesis really in the earlier commemorations of the, the uh, Seven Years' War, French and Indian War that uh, Christiane alluded to earlier, and I'm sure that several of you have participated in a very important uh, conference that the Omohundro helped organize at Brock University, uh, Contest for Continents in uh, 2000, was it 2009 or 2010, uh, Elena, I think you were, 2009. And then Phil Buckner, the uh, distinguished Canadian historian, are, uh, organized a conference in London uh, in uh, 2010, um, really looking at the conquest of uh, Canada, both in, in terms of historiography and uh, in terms of historical memory. However, for public history uh, in uh, New England and the American Northeast, um, it's really clear that, that the focus here on the French and Indian War commemoration uh, was, was chiefly centered on Western Pennsylvania and upstate New York, and there was comparatively uh, little activity in New England. And I think that's for the good reasons that obviously some of the most important contested terrain that's within U.S. territory today um, was located in those, uh, in those areas. And in New England, except on the frontiers, um, was comparatively uh, the site of very little actual military action, unless you include the, the northern reaches of Maine. Um, however, as uh, many of you know, um, Massachusetts was actually intensively engaged in this war, um, both in terms of manpower and in terms of uh, the, the treasure and blood and uh, the economic life of the colony. Um, and I guess it's a little hard to commemorate fiscal military effort, which may be why there was less of a splash uh, earlier on in the commemorative uh, calendar here, but we're trying to make up for that. Um, and uh, with the exception of, and I'm just now a little Chagrin there, not a surprise that I should have known, but I didn't realize that uh, Cuba was going to be putting on such a major uh, initiative to mark the conquest. So you'll have to, bullet point two isn't quite correct um, uh, with my claim that things have more or less wrapped up in 2010, but certainly um, aside from that in terms of the US context they have. And finally, um, military anniversaries commemorate because there's a great opportunity to have uh, reenactors uh, do their thing, um, but really no provisions have been made to commemorate the peace, and it really seemed like this was, was a major uh, lack um, and something that needed to be addressed. So what went in the way? Uh, the basic um, specs of the uh, project, where there will be an exhibition at the Old State House Museum in Boston from late fall, uh, late May to early fall of next year, concurrent series of historians roundtables exploring the interplay of 18th century war, peace, and the revolution, through the lens of 1763 uh, and reenactments, we hope, of uh, elements of Boston's uh, public celebrations of the peace uh, in August 1763, and we had, do have access to press accounts, which are really quite wonderful. They describe how the royal governor uh, had sort of a levee in the uh, old state house of all the, all the key figures in politics and business who congratulated him uh, on, 
the piece. Uh, the news of the piece had obviously circulated through the columns much earlier, but this was where the time was chosen by the colony to officially um, commemorate, uh, com or to mark the, the, the advent of peace. And the uh, royal governor actually went out onto the, wait, I will just go forward just for a second here, onto the balcony here, which you can see there, and actually read a proclamation of peace. And uh, troops were drawn up at the head of what's now State, was then King Street, with a feu de joie, which was answered by the cannons of uh, Fort William uh, out in the harbor. And then everyone retired for a dinner for uh, 200 uh, at Family Hall, which also still stands alone in a greatly altered state. And the uh, list of toasts that were given that night were published. And what's the, the, the irony is just fascinating, because one of the uh, toast is to the continued peace and tranquility of His Majesty's dominions in North America. And uh, at that time, of course, what was going on was Pontiac's Rebellion. And two years to the month were the uh, Stamp Act riots in Boston, uh, in which the uh, Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson's house was, was torn to pieces. Um, so clearly, uh, 1763 marked a major watershed that was not necessarily the advent of the Pax Britannica uh, that everyone hoped for. Just back up here. So we are hoping to reenact uh, some elements of, of the peace celebrations to bring 18th century life to the streets of Boston uh, next year. Uh, we've got a group of uh, sponsors and partners. I won't bore you by going through uh, detailing what each of them are doing, but you can see we do have a good team of um, institutions, uh, including the John Carter Brown Library, um, and the Old Huntville, which early on committed some funds to uh, sponsor one of the uh, series of the scholarly uh, roundtables. Oops. We do have some other allies that I'm working on trying to uh, rope in further. Uh, UK Foreign Commonwealth Office, the French Foreign Ministry. Um, I've been working on the Archie Diplomatique. And, and I should say, um, interpretively and philosophically, it's clear that the most important effects of 1763, the most lasting effects, were felt in terms of the North American, North American territory. So we do have to try to balance the fact what, what the, the, the ending of the French colonial regime on the mainland means for the future history of North America and how it deals with the wartime debt while trying to balance and reach um, the, the global story and reach the global partners. So, um, and we're also very concerned that this not become another chance where Anglo-American historians tell this story. So I've been working on the Archie Diplomatique, and I hope they're going to take part. Also uh, working uh, with the Canadian Department of Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, they have a treaty relations directorate, and uh, they have a treaty historian, uh, which I think is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty neat kind of job to have as a government bureaucrat, uh, because the, uh, there's a whole series of treaties that go back to 1763 are still part of uh, law and policy in Canada. And then we're working on some other partners, and you will see that uh, we are keen on, on making sure the Spanish side of the story is, is told. Um, so, and also, although we're focusing on the Peace of Paris signed by Britain, France, and Spain in February 1763, um, obviously there is a hell of a big war going on in the continent as well. And, um, well, again, because for a public history standpoint, we're trying to put this in a context that Americans can understand. We do want to forge a, uh, a connection with uh, the folks at uh, Hubertus Borg and hopefully uh, have a panel bring some speakers over to talk about the uh, continental dimension of the war. Hubertus Borg was where uh, Frederick and uh, Ray Teresa made uh, a separate piece. And then we're also working on other institutions with uh, 250th anniversaries that might be interested in uh, borrowing historians from us to talk about the worlds in which their institutions came to being. And a couple of interesting ones are Turo Synagogue here in Newport, which was uh, completed and dedicated in 1763. Uh, and um, the Governor's Academy, which is kind of funny, it's in North Shore of Boston. Um, it was actually originally Governor Dummer Academy. And as you can imagine from the name, the name of Fairley Brothers and all, uh, uh, Dumb and Dummer, um, it was not, it's, it's from long, from long standing has been sort of uh, people have a chuckle about that, and they, they did ultimately change their name to just the Governor's Academy, but it was founded by the Dummers of Massachusetts, who were a leading political family, and um, William Dummer um, died in 1763, and his will left funds to Dow Academy. So we're hoping to link up with them to bring programs about the world in which they took, came to being to their audiences, and also maybe they'll help sponsor what we're doing in Boston. 
and here's our planning committee, um, and we are still uh, we're still working on expanding this committee, but this is the this is the core as it now stands, with representatives from several of the participating institutions. And again, here is our uh, project headquarters and exhibition venue. Um, I really think it's it's very important. Again, as I said earlier, and I will try to be done by a quarter of it. That's keeping things on track time wise. Um, the old state house is really at the center of the story for, for several reasons. Um, it was, of course, the seat of provincial and royal government throughout the period of the wars of the mid-century. Um, but also, as such, and this is something that's often forgotten, it really served as a military command post uh, during this period um, uh, because the legislative, the royal governor had major military, he was the captain general of forces in Massachusetts Bay, which was the, you know, the biggest and most important one in the colony. Um, except for Rhode Island, maybe, um, and included all the territory of Maine. Um, and the legislature, which sat at the other end of the building, down here, this is the council chamber, the governor's chamber, and that's how he pops out to make his proclamations out of that uh, uh, balcony there. Um, but you know, the legislature had to pull all these requisitions for funds to uh, send t troops into, uh, into campaigns each year. So this, this building, as a governmental center, was intensely involved in the war effort. And as I mentioned, um, in 1763, it really was sort of the center of the public uh, commemoration of the peace. Um, and then when things go south with London over the structure and shape of the post-war imperial uh, uh, administration and taxation, this is really where some of the key battles and debates between the Massachusetts Bay province and London um, are fought in the legislative chambers. And ultimately, when things really go to hell, it's where uh, the Boston Massacre occurs uh, right in front of the uh, old state house. So it's really very much of this story of, of, of the war and the revolution in this period. We're very pleased to be able to have this exhibition. So right now, we're thinking uh, along the lines of having basically three modules. And I should just emphasize, uh, particularly this, this introduction module, uh, which is really the most difficult because we're talking about a truly global conflict. Okay. Um, and um, so trying to boil down the, uh, to give visitors within a very small exhibition space about a thousand square feet some sense of what that conflict is all about is very difficult. And there's some real lacunae, which, which I readily admit to, but we are working through our exhibit plan to try to address those. And so you can just see what we've done is we're trying to get a combination of different media so that both in terms of what they tell you interpretively, but also in terms of visually and aesthetically, um, they, they, they create a lively uh, visual dialogue amongst them. So here we have a very famous print of Governor William Shirley, who was uh, governor during the 1740s and at the beginning of the Seven Years' War, and actually was Braddock's second in command. And when Braddock was killed, he becomes commander in chief of British forces in North America for about a year. So again, this reminds us of how this, this building is, is so central to this story of, of, this, of the mid century wars. Um, the French cannonball from Fort Ticonderoga uh, with a Fleur de Lis stamp on it, which I think really sort of gets the point across about the uh, French uh, imperial military efforts, sort of like from France with love as it comes sailing to you. Although someone pointed out to me, it probably kind of fell up the trajectory because of the windage of that, that dent in one side. We have an example of the war club here. Uh, this pistol, which I were hoping to include, is very interesting, was given by Rack to Washington, and Washington kept it for the rest of his life, and it's an interesting because there's so many connections between the personnel and participants in the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution. It's an object that really makes that point. Of course, we can't miss uh, the death of Wolf, even though historians really argue that it's Quiberon Bay, where France's, uh, New France's uh, communications and trade get cut off. Um, that, that's really decisive and not the Plains of Abraham. Uh, it seemed like impossible for us not to make a gesture to that in terms of getting some popular recognition. And then up here, and I should just mention, um, our whole philosophy for this exhibition is really to look at the whole 1739 to 63 period as an interconnected period of uh, conflict, a global conflict, and uh, particularly for Massachusetts, which is in right at the beginning um, when that 30 years peace breaks down um, and uh, with the war of Jenkins era. And this is a very nice piece here. It's a punch strainer that was made from silver captured at Cartagena um, and was. Um, made into this very nice uh, object of uh, consuming this global beverage punch, which uses 
the mixture of other ingredients that really bring the, the whole of global economies of the mid 18th century together. So it's, again, the kind of artifact we like that we can really sort of tell a very large story in one small item. Just some additional artifacts we want to make sure to remind our visitors um, of the uh, continental um, aspect of this. And uh, clearly, uh, Maria Teresa and uh, uh, Frederick, who really are um, at Daggers Drawn for 20 years, um, are key figures there. Um, here's an example of the, uh, the Fletcher 35th foot uh, diary that's been so justly lauded as a great resource. And um, what's, I think, quite interesting, uh, this shows the Morrow Castle. Um, the Rhode Island Historical Society has a brand of year cap that we're hoping to borrow um, that, belong, that, is, that is believed to belong to the 35th foot and was actually repeated and picked up on the battlefield at Bunker Hill. So again, that's the kind of object which brings uh, a really uh, a sprawling story together in the era of the mid-century wars with the revolution together. And those are the kind of artifacts we're going to feature here. And then we do have a checklist. You can see some of the other things we're hoping to include. Again, it's really a wrestling match with only a very small number of exhibit cases to include the, all the items to tell the full story, but we are uh, trying to uh, do that. And this is some of the things we're looking for. So if you've got some good ideas for me, um, please, uh, I'd love to talk to you further. And then this is really the core of the exhibit. This is more fully realized. And um, it's, it features materials relating to the actual making of piece in 1763. We are going to open with an example of the uh, pamphlet war uh, over the terms of the piece. And this, I got from the library, but JCP has a copy of this uh, very important pamphlet. And here is the treaty itself. We have been in negotiations with the British National Archives at Kew uh, for about uh, since uh, almost a year now, and we're just in the final status of getting this loan held down. It looks very likely that this the British copy of the treaty that we wrote, the map of North America, will actually finally be in North America. And it's true. That's uh, the first uh, signature page. It's very interesting because it's a very, compared to some other uh, uh, diplomatic documents, it's actually rather humble work a day. I don't, there's not a lot of flourish to it. I don't know if that reflects the exhaustion of the negotiators just trying to get this done and be done with it. Um, but it, iconographically, it's sort of interesting. It's sort of counterintuitive, I guess, you think about Balin and Professor Balin's anomalies. This is a little anomalous in terms of its presentation. Uh, this is one of the second of three signature pages. And you can see that Bedford who negotiated for the British. Choiseul, Duc de Prélac, he's the cousin of Choiseul, he's the French foreign minister, and he's the architect of the French rebuilding after the Seven Years' War. And then uh, Grimaldi, who's um, representing the Spanish. And of course, the Grimaldis are the uh, royal family of Monaco. So again, this gets back to this whole notion of this internationalization, of course. Um, and he reported to John Ricardo Wall um, in the Spanish foreign ministry, who was of Irish uh, descent. So again, there's a very international story in which these borders are continually crossed and recrossed. And uh, as Alan rightly pointed out, in, in trying to tell the story of these wars, it's important not to, to uh, ignore these sort of countervailing uh, dynamics. Again, just to remind you the, how the map does change between uh, 63 and after, and the blue dots are there's Quebec, the forks of the Ohio, and uh, Louisiana, just to sort of orient you at those key sort of important flashpoints of the period. Uh, just an example of some of the French uh, uh, imagery uh, uh, um, commemorating the, the achievement of peace. And even though the war worked really badly for France, obviously sort of the nadir of the Austrian regime, um, it could be argued, I think, that it was sort of a triumph of diplomacy because they, they certainly seemed to have gotten more than a lot of members of the British, the British uh, political public thought was deserved. These are uh, uh, published editions that here at the JCB we hope to feature. And Article 4 of the treaty, this is the all important one that cedes uh, France's continental North American uh, possessions to Great Britain. The Royal Proclamation, we don't really leave that out. It's, it's really part of the enabling legislation for the treaty and very important in terms of First Nations history, of course. Um, and uh, I'll just quickly go through, because I've got, do I have like a, about a minute? Can I wrap it up, uh, Margo? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, um, this is, as you know, one of the blowbacks from the, from the 1763 peace was the fact that First Nations, or formerly allied to New France, did not see themselves as conquered and did not see themselves as becoming British subjects. And so that's where we get Pontiac's Rebellion, where they refused to accede to being treated as conquered subjects. 
In 64, there's a major peace conference that uh, Sir, uh, Sir William Johnson uh, convenes. This is a treaty document. And then, well, we've got the, uh, but Pontiac himself wasn't there. He doesn't make peace with William Johnson until 1766. And you can see, this is a very famous peace medal from 64, just restruck in 66. Why the fixation in 66? Well, we spent a lot of time trying to find a uh, treaty wampum belt that related to this story. And this is at the Pitt Rivers, and you can see it's got 1766 woven into it, and it is a nine row belt that we know from the treaty uh, minutes um, that nine row belts are exchanged. The curators at Pitt Rivers are sure that it's an 18th century make and not a later fabrication. Whether it was actually there or not, obviously, the, the, there's, there's unfortunately no paper trail to the sense it was acquired in the late 19th century, but interpretively, um, as a belt of the period that connects 64 to 66 and that last act of, of native uh, resistance to and British accommodation of the First Nations, we think it does make that point very powerful. And our final uh, module, which I'll just really just skip it, talking about the legacies of the, of the war, particularly for North America and how out of it ultimately emerges both the two the nation states, the bilingual nation state of uh, Canada, and ultimately the, the United States, that imperial republic. And so we have some, we'll have some material just documenting um, the fact that, you know, the treaty was very controversial. And uh, this is a nice uh, making fun of Bed Bedford is sort of the making of this piece soup. He was considered a Francophile. Um, here's another cartoon from the JCD attacking the terms of the piece. And of course, John Willis, who makes his career, his famous uh, 45, North Britain number 45 pamphlet, attacks the terms of the treaty. And he is really going out of hammer and tongs with, with Butte. Um, and that's really part of this sort of disordered political environment uh, in which the British attempt to enact imperial reform and taxation, and of course, ultimately, which leads to uh, a real breakdown of relations with the colonies, and we end up with uh, the Boston Massacre. Again, there's the old State House, our exhibit venue in the background. Um, and in the longer term, I think two things are important to point out because we are focused towards an American audience, but obviously in Canada, something very different happens. There's sort of a reconstitution and development of uh, French, the, the French culture and society here that persists, and we want to make sure that people understand that the French presence, even though the French empire dies in North America, that the French cultural and social presence, the survivance, as the Quebecers call it, uh, continues on in, in an interesting way under British protection. And of course, they, they refuse to uh, take up arms uh, on the Americans we have when they try to evade during the American Revolution. So it's important to remember what, what happens on the northern border. And then finally, Oops. Just to touch on the Revanche, obviously, Choiseul, this is the brother of the signer of the treaty, the architect of France's uh, rebuilding after the Seven Years' War, and of course, they become uh, allies of uh, the form of rebelling American colonists, and we all know uh, the ends to which that led. Um, and of course, there really is a balancing effort in telling the story, not to be overly uh, teleological, but on the other hand, we are in the free of visitors thousands of visitors are on the trail path of revolutionary history to try to put this in a context without putting the thumb on the historical scales and saying, oh, it led to the revolution for sure, but making, plotting those connections and those dynamics is a, is a balancing act we're trying to do. And um, so that's what we're hoping to achieve next year for the Peace of Paris 250th, and I thank you all for appearing with my uh, slightly uh, overlong uh, presentation. Thank you. time and for anyone who's listened to me today uh, in terms of warming up, I would invite you to head out to the coffee section. Please feel free to ask our presenters questions, but this will get us back on the schedule. So thank you so much for this afternoon.